We're here for sunrise service. Uh, I just say thank you for being here this morning, but as well, you got point number one of my message. Uh, it's a four-point sermon, and I put the first point this morning in the sunrise service, and I'm not going to preach it all again, but I'll probably hit the highlights here in just a few minutes. But I've been preaching uh, over the last several weeks a series of messages entitled, Looking, or, or Lead Me to the Cross, and my first message in that was looking at the cross, looking to the cross, where we stood back in Jesus' life, and we look forward as Jesus looked forward to the cross. He uh, told his disciples that's where he was going. We talked about that. Then last uh, Sunday, we looked at the cross, talked about the crucifixion, Jesus' death on the cross, and what it accomplished for us. But today, we're looking beyond the cross, looking beyond the cross to what Jesus has already accomplished. And that's where we're going to be headed in just a moment, but before I forget, uh, and I will if I don't do it, I want to take time to receive our morning tithes and offerings, so if I could get a couple of my ushers to come forward. Mikey, Alex, thank you. I appreciate that very much. We appreciate those who are faithful in giving. If you're a guest this morning, we're not asking you to give in any way. If you do, that's, for, that's wonderful, but we're not asking that. This is time for those of us who are regulars here to support the work that God is doing here at Ozark Bethel. Father, we love you. Thank you today for this day and for each one who is here. Thank you, God, again, for the privilege of giving. God, as you pour into our lives, God, it gives us the privilege, the opportunity to pour into the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for that honor today. We ask, God, that you would bless each one that is here. May your presence be real among us. May your word speak loudly to us today. And Father, I pray that there would be a special blessing upon each one who is able to give this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, thank you for your giving. Don't forget after service this morning uh, about the egg hunt. Uh, we'll be giving you some instructions at the conclusion of the service. We've got egg hunt for the younger children up to age... Starting at what age? The first age group? Three to five, Three to five six to eight, nine. six to nine, and then ten to twelve. And then the old people. The kids get to get entertained watching the old people out there this morning. So, looking forward to that. Amen. We're going to begin looking uh, at, at is what has been the theme verses of this series of sermons uh, the, over the last two and then today three weeks, and this will conclude this series. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, says this. Are we having problems back there? We are. All right. We love it when that happens. Technical difficulties. You know, when the screen goes blank and that kind of... So just follow with me as I read here. It says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's the focus of these verses. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father, again, we pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your word this morning. God, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, hide me in the fullness of the Spirit today, and Lord, that you would bring forth your word, your message to each of us. Lord, we long to receive from your word today. It is bread for our souls, and so Lord, help us to eat, to be nourished upon that bread today. Speak to us, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I started this sermon talking about the diary of the resurrection. I needed to use the D word. Uh, all my topic, my points have a D in them. So the diary of the resurrection, and I laid out uh, the points of what took place at the resurrection, the events as they, they went through. And when you read the four Gospels, sometimes you begin to think, hold it. Uh, they're not telling things the same. But we talked about the fact that these were four different writers writing from four different standpoints, four different different viewpoints so it looks a little different but we we kind of knit them all together in one story and, and hopefully those who were here this morning kind of get a better picture of the of the 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what I want to continue on, my second point, is the demonstration. The demonstration of the resurrection. Or in reality, the evidence for the resurrection. And you start there by understanding that the life and the death of Jesus Christ is not a questionable thing. You know, some people would say, well, it's just all good stories written in this fairy tale book called the Bible. Well, it's not a fairy tale book, number one. It has been proven to be true again and again and again by archaeological finds, by writings of others, and I, I could go into that, but I'm not going to take time. One of those being a, a man by the name of Josephus, who was, who is a very well-known and trusted Jewish historian. And he, it is a was. He lived in the days of Jesus. He wrote what is called the Antiquities of the Jews. He was not a Christian. He wasn't a believer in Jesus Christ. But in his historical writings, he wrote this. It says, at this time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, but those who became his disciples did not abandon in his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of the Christians so named after him have not disappeared to this day. So here is a historian writing about Jesus' life, his death, and even his resurrection as being factual things that took place. And there are others that wrote that talked about Jesus. Uh, a very, very well-known and famous Roman historian named Tacitus and others. Um, there was a, 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 well, I'm not even going to go into that. I'm just not going to go that direction and miss out some of this stuff. But the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ is not a, a fairy tale. It's a fact. And almost every historian in the world will agree with that point. But where most have a struggle, most non-believing historians, is in the resurrection. That which we are here to celebrate today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. People don't just rise from the dead. Right? As I said this morning, we have come to hear that word and we're just kind of content with it, especially if you have any Christian background. We just take it for granted. But I just ask, anybody know somebody that has rose from the dead? Just could you share with us? Nobody. Well, that's because there hasn't ever been anybody but Jesus who has raised from the dead, but yet some people struggle with believing it and would say, well, there's no evidence. But there is overwhelming evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Overwhelming evidence. As we stated already, the fact of his crucifixion, well documented and unattested by most, most historians. But secondly... We have individuals in, in the scriptures, but as well, the scriptures are historical, who speak of real experiences with Jesus after he rose from the dead. They testify that they really did see Jesus after they saw him die on the cross, saw him buried in a tomb, and he was there for three days. But then they saw him alive later. And you say, well, you know, some people will say, well, they were having hallucinations, imaginations. Well, they didn't think so. These individuals didn't think they were hallucinations. They believed they were seeing real person Jesus Christ. And not only did they think that, their lives were changed by that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. They had no doubts. In fact, they believed it so much that many of them died confessing their belief in Jesus Christ. Now, you know, you might say you believe something, but when, so to speak, someone puts a gun to your head or, or uh, holds a sword to your throat, whatever it may be, however they died, and says, are you still going to tell me that's what you believe? Then, it, then you determine whether you really believe it. And so many of these in Scripture and many since then stood the test of even their death, declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. 
A very, a, a third point, a very important thing that probably most of us would never think about is the fact of, of the, to a historian, the sooner something is, is written about or declared after the event happened, the more believable it is. For instance, if my children were to write about my life, say, this, say that, okay? They, they were going to write a, a, something about my life. If my kids wrote it, who had lived when I lived, saw me live, that'd be one thing. But if my great, 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 great grandchild wrote about my life 150, 200 years ago, well, you know, they may not have all the facts exactly right. They didn't see it for themselves. They've had to listen to the voice of others who've passed on. You, you understand what I'm saying? So here's the fact. The resurrection of Jesus Christ began to be declared within days of his resurrection. It was written about within just a few years of his resurrection. The Gospels of Mark, the Gospel of Mark was written within 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. That is very close. I'll give you an example. Alexander the Great. Anybody ever heard of Alexander the Great? We all have. He's a historical figure that's been written about. The first thing that was written about him was written 280 years after his death. 280 years. And the most, uh, most well-known, the most uh, accepted uh, things being fact about his life were actually written 450 years after his death. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was written about by the Apostle Paul within just a few years of his death. Of, excuse me, of his resurrection, Jesus. Mark, 30 years after. Matthew, 50 years after. Luke, 55 years. Uh, John, 60 years after. And we read all those things this morning in our earlier service. These are all evidences of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They aren't just hearsay. They're accounted for. And they're written down in history. So we have the fact that the historians say, yes, Jesus is a real figure. He lived and he died. We have the fact that people really had an experience with Jesus, believe they did. Thirdly, the historical facts are there. But here's probably the most important or the, a couple of the most important of things that say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is real. Number one, the transformed lives of those who witnessed his resurrection. Think about the 11 disciples who were in the garden the night that Jesus were arrested. They fled and ran out of fear that they were going to be arrested too. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead and suddenly their lives were changed and they became bold about their stance. All 11 disciples... Actually, 12, because there was someone who was put to replace Judas who was committed suicide. All 12 disciples and others all died horrendous, torturous deaths for their faith. Now, let's say these 12 men, these 12 men got in a room and said, look, guys, okay, he, he died, but we've got to just keep this thing going. And we're going to tell everybody that he rose from the dead, that we saw him, and that he's alive. Okay, we're going to tell that. Okay, this is our story. Let's stick to it. And they go out and they begin to tell that everywhere they go. Now, do you imagine that all 12 of those men would have died for that lie? Don't you think one of those 12 or one of somebody who knew them would have finally, when they were about to be hung, had their head cut off while Peter was crucified upside down. Uh, Matthew was stabbed to death. Uh, I believe it was Thomas who was filleted alive in India. Don't you think these guys would have probably somewhere along the line said, okay, go, okay, go, go, no, 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 it's all a lie. It's all a lie. Don't kill me. No, 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 it's all a lie. None of them. They all died for what they believed. And not only them, many other Christians who heard what they had to say died for their faith. Lives were and still are being transformed by the message and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My life has been transformed. My life has been transformed. I can only imagine where I would be today without Jesus Christ in my life. I, I, I don't want to imagine it because I would have not been a good person by any means. And I thank God that Jesus Christ changed my life. And many of you here this morning are the same place. But there are two individuals specifically 
whose lives were changed. It's very, very telling about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born and lived on this earth. He had brothers. Now, Jesus' father was the Holy Spirit, was God. He wasn't born of a natural birth. But his mother married and she had other, had other children. Jesus had brothers. And one of them's name was James. And the Bible tells us that James and his other brothers, they didn't believe in who Jesus was. They had no faith in him as the Messiah. They laughed at him. They, made, they gave him a hard time. They thought he was a nutcase. They didn't want anything to do with him. Until after he rose from the dead. The Bible tells us that Jesus had an encounter after he rose from the dead with his brother James. And James was so transformed that he became the leader of the church. He was the key leader, the key pastor, uh, whatever you want to call the superintendent of the church in Jerusalem. His life was, he had been a skeptic, he had been a non-believer until after Jesus rose from the dead and met him. There's another man that you'll know, a man by the name of Paul. His name was Saul, and then he changed it. But Saul was not only an unbeliever, Saul was a hater of the people who followed Jesus Christ. He went around, he would have been the guy who would break through the door this morning, walk in here, and rest me and take me off to have me killed because I'm preaching Jesus Christ, him crucified and raised from the dead. That's the kind of guy Paul was. He was a Jew who was, who was just dead fast that, that Judaism was the way and that his Jesus was a fake and a fraud and not real until the risen Jesus and Paul had an encounter and the apostle Paul who he became his life was turned upside down to such a point that Paul said I count all things lost in view of the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior Paul's life was turned around and he became probably the greatest apostle, the writer of much of the New Testament. But Paul didn't start out that way. He was arresting for years. He was arresting Christians, having them uh, uh, killed for their, for their faith until he met Jesus Christ. There is undeniable evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. If you're here this morning, and I'm glad that you're here, I hope that you're listening to me today. If you are one of those who have doubted whether this is all real, I would challenge you, look at the evidence. Jesus Christ indeed died, was buried for three days, but he rose from the dead. So what does this all have to do with us? Well, there's a doctrine, there is a teaching, there is a, something that we learn from the, from the deity, the God, Godship of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, there is the, the, the doctrine that number one, God exists. You know, this world is full of people who don't believe that God exists. Can I tell you that atheism cannot be stand in the fact that the resurrection, that's why atheists will not tell you that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then there indeed is a God. That there indeed is. And that's the doctrine of the resurrection. God is real. But secondly, not only does God exist, God is involved in the history and the works of mankind. God is not some ethereal imagination or some being out there who kicked it all off and then got back out of the way. That's what Gnosticism says. No, what the Bible tells us through the resurrection, the life, the burial, the death, the, resur the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that God not only is there, but that he is involved in human history. God wants to be involved in your life and in my life. We talked about that a little bit more this morning in the sunrise service. God cares about us as individuals, not just as a group of people, but God cares about us as individuals. So God exists. He is at work in human history. And God has provided a way of salvation for all of us who have sinned. I said for all of us who have sinned. Number one, I'm saying us because it includes me. But number two, I'm saying it's us because it includes every one of us who are here this morning. All of us have sinned. 
All of us have, have come short of God's standards of holiness and righteousness. And the judgment, the rules, God made it. God, God put it all together and God got to make the rules. Come on. You build it, you can make the rules. Right? Yep. You build it, you make the rules. God made it all. And he made the rules. And the rules were this. If you break my rules, it means death. It's that simple. One rule, one, one judgment. If you break the rules, there's death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Separation from God. You can be mine. You can live in eternity with me. I will bless you. I will care for you. I will provide for you. I'll do everything. You will be so blessed. But if you break my rules, there's only one thing. You have to be separated because God cannot be touched by sin. And we've all sinned. But God made a plan to save us nonetheless. He exists. He's involved in our lives. And he has made a plan of salvation for every single one of us. That's the doctrine of salvation today. It's that simple. Jesus made a way for every one of us to be saved. Point number four. So we've had the diary. We've had the, the, the documents. We've had the... the uh, I've got to remember my own points. We've had the doctrine, and now we're at the destiny. The destiny that's out there for every person due to the resurrection. First of all, for the saved, the born-again believers. Hear me this morning. If you're born again, if you're a child of God, your destiny is sure, and that is life eternal in the presence of God with Jesus Christ, your Savior. You have eternal salvation provided. That is your destiny as a child of God, a believer in Jesus Christ. If you become born again, you have a destiny of salvation. It's that simple. But if you've not believed, if you're a sinner, we're all sinners. Some of us are saved because we've put our faith in Christ. But if you've not put your faith in Christ, then the destiny that you have is a destiny of eternal, eternal damnation. You say, preacher, now you're getting mean. I, I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you what the rules are. Without Christ, the destiny for everyone is eternal damnation. Damnation not only includes physical punishment, going to hell, the lake of fire, the physical punishment, yes. But the worst part is the hopelessness of hell. As a Christian, I am filled with hope. Today, I am rejoicing. I am celebrating because I have hope. The world can, can blow up, can pass away, can die. It doesn't matter because I've been promised eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. I have hope no matter what through Jesus. But without Christ, there is no hope. And the worst part of hell is not going to be the fire and all that we, we think about, even though that's part of it. The worst part of hell is there will no longer ever be hope again. You have hope right now because you still have a chance to turn to Jesus Christ if you have not accepted him. There is still hope. But when the end of this life comes, if you've not received Jesus, all hope is gone. That will be the worst part of hell. For the saved, there's eternal salvation. For the sinner, there's eternal damnation. And for Satan and his demons, there is a destiny in the lake of fire, the Bible tells us. Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 through 15. I'm not going to read it all to you. But it says that the devil and his demons were thrown into the lake of fire. And then God sits up his judgment seat. And everyone stands before God. And those, name, those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, who have not accepted Jesus, they would all also be thrown in the lake of fire where they will suffer the damnation of hell for all eternity. Satan and his demons have a destiny as well and it's apart from God. I want you to know this morning the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something you have to believe with blind faith. No, it's something you believe in faith as you examine the evidence. We can believe. We can understand and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It can be demonstrated with overwhelming evidence. It teaches us that God exists and that he's involved in our lives. He's made a plan of salvation. But we have to choose. Let me ask you this morning, what do you choose to believe about Jesus Christ and his resurrection? What do you choose to believe? 
What are you going to do with the overwhelming evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? And I've went through it very fast. If you want to hear more, I would be glad to share with you more. The overwhelming evidence Jesus rose from the dead. What are you going to do with that? How will Jesus' death, life, and resurrection affect your life? It will affect your life one way or the other. It will. How will you choose to allow it effect? Will you be brought into a destiny of hope and life? Or are you going to have a destiny of hopelessness and death? One way or the other, the resurrection of Jesus Christ affects every one of our lives. What are you going to do with Jesus today? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Hallelujah. Father, this morning I've tried to lay the plan of, of God, the, the gospel, the truth, out as clearly as I can. Father, I don't want to deceive. I don't want to hoodwink. I just want people to hear the truth. Father, our world is so filled with lies. We've seen it. It has been portrayed to us, the lying of, 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 the, of the media, the lying in many ways of our government. So many lies that we hear day after day. But Father, I pray today that everyone who is here would understand that what I've tried to share today is the truth about Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's anyone this morning who has been ignoring it, pushing it away, doubting it. Father, I pray today that they would come face to face, face to face with the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. He arose to bring us victory and to bring us hope. Father, speak to each heart. Holy Spirit, work on each life this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name. If your head's still bowed right now, if you would, please, just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Just let this be a moment between you and God. Don't worry about those around you. Please, just let it be a private time. My eyes are closed. My head is down as well. What are you doing with Jesus Christ today? What are you doing with Jesus? This morning, if you're here and, and you've not been a follower of Jesus, you've not been believing in Jesus, but maybe you've heard something in what I've said today, the Holy Spirit has, has brought it to your mind and made it real to your heart, and today you would like to say, I want to change. I want to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Like the Apostle Paul, like James, I've seen the truth, and I'm, I'm going to turn, and I want to begin to believe in Jesus today. I want to be a follower follower of Jesus Christ. If that's you, I'm going to raise my eyes. I'm going to look. And if that's you today, and you just raise your hand. Everyone else looking down, everyone else your eyes closed. If you say, I want to be a follower of Jesus today, could you just lift your hand? I just want an opportunity to be able to pray for you. That's it. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I just want to be able to pray with you. Is there anyone? Yes. Amen. I see that hand. Is there anyone else? I just want to be a follower of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, this morning I thank you for this one. Lord, who has said I, I need to make that decision real in my life. Father, I pray that you draw them to yourself. Lord, make it real to them more than ever before. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would come now and begin that work of transformation. I can't save anyone, Lord. I don't have that power, but you do. You came to bring us life and life more abundantly. Whosoever believes in you would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the promise. God, I pray that that would be real for this individual. If there are others today, Lord, maybe they didn't have the courage to lift their hand. They, they just weren't sure. God, work in their hearts. Draw them to yourself. Today, Lord, we are celebrating what Jesus Christ has done for us. Lord, this, this, the games, the egg hunt, this stuff, Lord, it's part of the celebration. It's just time for us to share together as families. But God, the focus and the truth today is that Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus rose from the grave to 
bring salvation to us. And Lord, we rejoice in that fact today. The hope of salvation is ours today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. I am so thankful that you have been here this morning. I hope that the truth has been real to your heart and life. Um, Angie, I'm going to ask if you would go ahead and head to the back door. And she's going to give us some instructions here in just a minute on where to go for the different age groups. We'll do one at a time because I know that you want to watch your kids hunt them eggs. Uh, moms and dads, no cheating. You let them kids find I love it when I watch the parents and they're going like, there's one, there's one, it's over there. <laughs> just can't stand. So we've got an egg hunt just for you. We'll do that last and we're looking forward to that. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Greet one another and we'll gather up outside and get the egg hunts going here in just a few minutes. Lots of stuff for everybody that's here as you go today.